So, um, so let me do this question. We've done this type of uh, forces analysis or the standard strategy questions many, many times. And in fact, there's a version of a similar question I've done where it's actually more general than this. It's got an angle here and another angle here that's not 90 degrees. But, um, but let me do this question so that you have more examples of me drawing free body diagrams and approaching these types of uh, scenarios in a systematic way. So, um, so it almost doesn't matter what the question asks. So let me just to get started with the four standard strategy steps. And those steps are, let me just write it out as a reminder for myself and for you, uh, standard strategy. The first step is a drawing free body diagram. Then you need to define axis. And there are some things that you need to watch out for as you are defining the axis. I'll mention them as we get there. Third step, you have to break forces into components. And fourth step is the um, the step that a lot of people want to like a jump to, but it takes uh, the first three steps to prepare. You need to write down Newton's second law equations. Um, the acceleration is equal to net force divided by mass. And there are some things to watch out here as well. I'll mention them as we go. So let me start with the drawing stand of free body diagrams. So my I have two objects in my system, so I'm going to need to draw two free body diagrams. I'll have to draw uh, one for the mass one and a separate diagram for mass two. And again, I'd like to remind you that the recommended way to draw free body diagram is separately from the other diagrams you may have. I do see people drawing arrows on the provided diagrams of the things and I guess um, <laughs> I, I'm not really cracking down on those as I should. I don't take points off as I should. <laughs> but my recommendation is draw a separate diagram. This is a graphical problem solving tool. There's a very precise way in which you should do it. It's not um, just a doodle. It's an actual problem solving tool in which you should be precise. So looking at mass one, I'm going to think through what forces should be there. And gravity is always an easy force to draw. And it's a good thing to start out with because it'll help you think through what other forces must there be. Because with this mass, I kind of know in what direction it should accelerate. It should accelerate along the slope, either up or down. It kind of depends on the, the arrangement of the masses. I do know it shouldn't be accelerating straight down. So it makes me think of what other forces could there be. And as you're thinking through that, uh, what you should be thinking about is what other things are touching that object. Remember, gravity is the only force you are allowed to draw uh, without other things touching the thing. At least in this class, gravity is the only non-contact force. So I have two places, two things that are touching this block one. I have this surface here. So there might be a normal force that's coming from the surface of contact. And I have this string that's touching it here. So there might be a tension force that's, uh, um, that's uh, pulling the block in the direction of the string. So tension force T1. Um, Okay, and I think with these three forces, I should have enough room to make the block accelerate in the direction that I think it should accelerate in. So I think I'm done drawing all the forces for block one. You should always ask yourself the question, did I draw all the forces? Try to make sense of uh, the direction of the net force that your forces indicate um, things should be in. So I'm moving on to mass two. Um, again, start out with the gravity. It's always good to... Um, Start with a force that's almost always going to be there. And I guess it, here um, you might have this force and think, oh yeah, it's going to accelerate downward. I'm done. <laughs> no, don't do that. Uh, do think through still, did I draw all the forces? All the things that are touching the object, did I account for them? I haven't yet, so let me draw the tension force here so that... Uh, so that I have accounted all the forces. And, you know, there's nothing else touching it. Uh, this uh, surface is drawn in a way it's not touching it. And even if it were, we wouldn't need any force uh, in the direction perpendicular to the surface to push it anyway. So, um, so I think I draw, have drawn all the forces. And let me do a little bit of a simplification by, um, by reading through the text. Um, Although maybe I can't. Um, so I'm looking at these uh, labels I've drawn, T1 and T2, two separate labels. 
And uh, what I'm looking for is some statement about the pulley. Uh, I'm looking for especially one that says that the pulley is frictionless and massless. Those are the conditions that I need in order to be able to say that um, that the tension on one side, you know, T1 here is equal to T2 here. Um, now, I don't see that string as shown, light string as shown, inclination, of, it says nothing about the pulley. So let me leave these labels on and then later on I'll just have to make an assumption that they're going to be the same because that's so common. But um, at this point, based on reading of the question text alone, I don't have a way to say be able to say that they are the same but in the end i'm gonna still be forced to, to um, say that they are the same otherwise this problem is not solvable <laughs> so um so i've drawn all the forces this is my uh, standard strategy step number one um drawing dr have drawn all the free body diagrams now i need to define my axis and as you define your axis what you're looking for is you want to define your x-axis so that it's a parallel to the anticipated direction of acceleration so here i think a mass one um will probably accelerate upward this way so that's the direction i want my x-axis to be so that's my x and this is my y and note how as I draw my axis, I try to make them distinguishable from the force vectors. I don't want any uh, decorations to be confused with my uh, forces. Uh, with my object too, and as you're defining axis, you can define different axis for each object. So I would just uh, stick to this condition for each object. So here it's accelerating in a different direction, you know, to be consistent with the direction that the string is moving. And I let that be my, um, let that be my uh, positive x-axis. Even though it's a downward, it's not horizontal, doesn't matter. Just let the direction of your um, uh, acceleration be your positive x-axis. And here I'm gonna just uh, um, skip the def definition of the y-axis because I see that nothing interesting is happening in along the y-axis here. So I've defined all my axis. Now I need to break force into components. So um, I look at which forces are not already in the direction of an axis. You know, tension and normal force, they are fine. They are already in the direction of an axis. Um, these forces are fine. This gravitational force is what needs to be broken into components, you know, X component and Y component. Um, so, and as I'm defining them, as I'm breaking them into components, I might also figure out what direction they are in. So um, a few more decorations, let's see. So this angle is the angle that I've been given, you know, theta equal to 40 degrees. And so this is not theta. Wait, is that not theta? Uh, 90 degrees, no, that's not theta. Um, so this, this angle should be, I think if you work through the geometry, that'll tell you that's 90 degrees minus theta. And this is 90 degrees. So that means this must be theta, okay. So once you have correctly identified where the given angle is, then you can use a trig identity or the, the you know, trig functions defined. So ka toa uh, to label these with appropriate uh, hypotenuse, which will always be your vector magnitude, uh, times a sign for opposite side and cosine for adjacent side. So this is the opposite side, so it should have the magnitude of mg sine theta, m1g sine theta, and this should this is the adjacent side to the angle, so it should have m2g cosine theta. And note how uh, this is actually the x component that gets associated with sine, this is the y component that gets associated with cosine. It's, uh, um, I, I always do this uh, triangle drawing exercise because there is no other hard and fast rule that you can always use always correctly, like always associating x with the cosine and y with the sine. That'll be right maybe 50% of the time. So just draw the triangle, work through the exercise of identifying the angle and the opposite and adjacent sides. So that's a step number three. I've broken my force into components and in the process of doing that also, um, also, um, the, uh, also uh, figured out what the size of those uh, components should be. So having done all that, we are finally at step number four, where we are ready to write down Newton's second law equations. That's really what steps one through three are for. Um, it helps you think through step-by-step step, um, um, 
what are the things you should consider. And by the time you get to step number four, you can just basically copy the information that's uh, in your decorated free body diagram. Uh, that's what I mean by saying uh, this is your graphical problem solving tool. It allows you to annotate everything so that when you get to step number four, you can just write down your equations. So for my object one, for the axis x, um, my, um, so my acceleration in the x direction, which will be the acceleration, is going to be equal to the net force. Um, so sum of all the forces in the x direction, that's going to be t1. M, uh, minus mg sine theta, t1 minus m1g sine theta, um, divided by m1, mass of the object that you are writing the equation for. And I think that's the equation, it's not going to be equal to zero. Uh, along the y direction, so the purpose of defining your axis this way is that the acceleration in the y direction will be zero because um, you uh, arranged your axis so that it doesn't accelerate in that direction. You add up all your forces, N1 minus the Y component of gravity, M1, <laughs> M1G cosine theta, M1G cosine theta, and divided by M1. Here, uh, this doesn't really matter because the left-hand side is zero. You can imagine multiplying through the left and right-hand side by M1. Uh, object number two. So here, normally we would need to draw um, two. E we will, normally we would need to write two equations for x and y directions. But uh, here, I, only x direction has something interesting happening. So I'm just gonna ignore the y direction and write my equation for the x direction only. So it's gonna be acceleration is equal to. And one advantage of having defined the downward as positive is that. If my A is positive, my acceleration is in the positive direction. I don't have to worry about the extra minus signs here or anything like that. So acceleration is equal to M2G minus tension T2 divided by the mass of the thing that I'm writing the equation for. So I have three equations, one, two, three equations. And hopefully I have only three unknown, but I kind of know that's not the case. Let's count my unknowns before I go into any solution step. So I have acceleration, that's one unknown, I need to find that. I have tension T1, that's another unknown, I need to find that. And uh, normal force, even though I, I don't have to find that, you know, it's asking for acceleration and tension only, but normal force, it's unknown. So it's a third unknown. And uh, my uh, third equation has the second unknown uh, or the fourth unknown T2, second of the two tensions. So I have three equations, four unknowns, and that's, uh, uh, that's uh, problematic for me. And if you are, you know, somehow trying to solve for N1 here from the second equation, all you've done is you've uh, used up one equation and solved for one unknown. So like you can consider this. In fact, let me just not even consider it because we don't need it. Um, so if you just uh, took out this equation, not even consider it, you still have two equations and three unknowns. So what you need is really a third equation and I'm going to write that as my tension T1 is equal to my tension T2. And this is not fully justified. I really needed this statement about the pulley to be able to do that fully justified. But here my partial justification is that unless I use this, I don't have enough information to solve the, the situation. Um, if uh, I would either have to be given the friction on the pulley or its mass, <laughs> or I would be have to told that I don't have to worry about this, I'm gonna assume that I don't have to worry about that. So I have uh, three equations, three unknowns. I should be able to solve it. Uh, let me do the rest of this in computer algebra system in the interest of time and also to demonstrate um, this uh, really useful tool that uh, you to be expected to use in a professional setting. So uh, I'm going to define, uh, declare the variable, uh, the symbols that I intend to use. Uh, theta, let's see, M2, T2, I think that's all the symbols. If I forgot something, it'll complain later. Um, let me define my equations. My equation one is um, uh, acceleration is equal to, oh, didn't need that. Acceleration is equal to T1 minus M1 times G times sine theta divided by M1. 
uh, my equation 2 is, I'm going to skip the one that I scratched out. Uh, acceleration is equal to, and uh, the same symbol for acceleration justifies based on the string connecting them. They must have the same magnitude. M2 times G minus T2 divided by M2. And my equation 3 is the one that fixes the, um, the, the, uh, it fixes the, um, <laughs> the tensions being different. Uh, now, if you didn't do the thing I did and just use the same symbol for both of them, that's fine. That's almost always what it's going to be. And let me just print this out so that I can verify that uh, I typed it in correctly. Yeah, equation one, equation two, equation three. Good. So um, I've shown the internal documentation for the solve function before, so I'll just use it. So I'm solving for this uh, system of equations, and I'm telling it to solve for acceleration, one unknown, and the two unknowns, t1 and t2. They're going to be the same, but I still need to specify them so that Sage Math knows that they are the unknowns that we are solving for. The rest are assumed to be, uh, assumed to be known. Uh, let me put this into solutions variable, and we'll print it. Um, Okay, it's giving me a, a set of equation, solutions, one set. That's what this uh, one um, inside the thing is. It's solved for A, T1, and T2, yeah. So of the solutions variable, the first element, the very first one is going to be, give me the acceleration. And then, um, and I can just take the second element and ignore the third one because uh, third one, let's see, algebraically, does it appear to be different? No, even algebraically, it's the same. So, so I'm going to take this, and uh, one of the reasons I like using Sage Math is I can also use this to plug in all the numbers. So we are given the uh, mass of the blocks and the angle and G, the gravitational acceleration I know. So I'm going to substitute those using the keyword um, um, specification syntax. M1 uh, is 2 kilograms, M2 is uh, 4.2 kilograms, and theta is 40 degrees. Sage math only takes radians, so I have to convert the degrees to radians. Uh, pi divided by 180. Um, and G is 9.8. I think that's all the uh, parameters. Yeah, so acceleration is going to be 4.61 meter per second squared. Let me do the same thing with the tension. And tension is going to be 21.8 Newton. Let's plug those in and make sure that they are correct. 4.61 and uh, 21.8. Yeah, so that's a, a um, pretty um, simple. It's a simple one, so you get used to it. I mean, the first time you're seeing it, 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 you know, this is the kind of the standard, the typical classic question, because really the only way to solve questions like this is to use the standard strategy, is to use the, uh, the multi-step problem solving strategy that you teach and go through it step by step. Once you get used to this approach, it should become easy to you. It should become almost mechanical things that you can do in your sleep. But um, the only way this becomes easy <laughs> is for you to learn the way we teach it, uh, which uh, is meant to break it down so that anybody can do it um, with enough you know, patience and practice.